In this lecture, I'd like to talk to you about the angular momentum of a rotating rigid object, and then the total angular momentum of any external angular momentum, and the angular momentum of an object about its axis. So that was a bunch of words, okay? Sorry. So let's get back to it. So let's define some of those words and think a little bit about what all those words mean. A rotating but rigid object basically just means it's a solid. Okay, so if it's a rigid object, it's a solid, and the particles within the object don't move with respect to one another. Now, you may think that that's pretty straightforward, but if you think about it, if something is liquid or gushy, then the object can deform as it's rotated, and due to the fact of, you know, centrifugal forces, it might very well do that. It might slosh around if it's a liquid, or flatten out if it's a deformable object, and then it would bulge uh, uh, towards the outside of the rotation, okay? So we're going to assume that it's something strong and solid and that the object um, doesn't deform and the particles in the object don't move with respect to one another. All right, now if that's the case, then let's look here at this little image of the disk. What happens is any point that you want to name within that object is going to be rotating with the same angular speed. Now, it's not going to be rotating with the same speed because depending on how far it is away from the rotation axis, it might have a different um, uh, speed, v sub i, but its angular speed will be the same at all points, okay? Now, we're going to define the angular velocity vector, uh, omega vector, to point along the rotation axis according to the right-hand rule, okay? So, this right-hand rule is kind of different you take your right hand and you let your fingers curl naturally, right? Just holding it up like you're getting ready to give a thumbs up, but you haven't gripped your palm all the way in right, okay? Now, you're going to let your fingers curl in the direction of the rotation. So, for example, looking top down, if the rotation is counterclockwise, then my thumb would point upward, and that would be the definition of my uh, rotation axis. It would point up. If, on the other hand, the rotation as I look down is clockwise, then that would mean my thumb would have to point down, and that would be the rotation axis, okay? Okay, so that's how we define that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use our regular definition of angular momentum, and then what we're going to do is we're going to break up our extended object into a bunch of little tiny pieces, and then sum over all those pieces to find the total angular momentum of the system. So let's start off with something simple like this hoop, okay? So you have a hoop, it's got a mass, total mass, big M, and a radius of the hoop, big R. And we're going to assume that the hoop is spinning about its own center of mass. So in the plane of this screen here, the hoop is spinning about its center counterclockwise, okay? And that causes this little slice of the hoop, which I've labeled here M sub I, okay? Little M sub I. That causes this one little piece, this little slice, to be moving to the left with um, velocity v sub i at this particular instant in time, okay? Now remember that this is a rigid object, and so they all have the same angular speed. So the speed of the object at some distance r away would be v is equal to omega times r. So we defined and talked about that in a previous lecture, and that's true for rotating rigid objects, okay? All right, now we're going to sum and find the angular momentum, the total angular momentum of this object, all right? Now here, we're going to say that our rotation axis is the z-axis, okay? So here we have x cross y um, is in the plane of the screen, and z is coming into and out of the screen, right? So it's penetrating through the screen this way. So that means that our r cross p for each little bit i, so I, I guess I should call it ri cross pi, um, we're going to sum over all those things. So let's find the magnitude of that. And so the magnitude of each one of those little pieces would be the magnitude of ri times the magnitude of pi times the sine of theta i, which is the angle in between each one of the ri's and the little pi's. Now, because this is a hoop, and we're going to assume that the hoop has a thickness that's negligible, okay, 
we're going to call the radius of our hoop big R. So what that means is that the distance from the rotation axis to the point in question will be big R for all the points on the hoop. Okay, so all of my ri are equal to big R. All right, so I'm going to plug that in here, R. Now, my pi. Each one of my pi has the same magnitude, okay, because it's a little slim hoop, right? We're, we're ignoring any differential bits as we move radially outward. And we're just calling that little slice, right? And we're saying that it's at a distance r. So that means that since v is equal to omega r, they're all the same. All those velocities are the same because they're the same distance from the center of the hoop. So we can write our momentum pi as mi times vi, right? Now we're finding the magnitude, okay, so it's just mi times vi, and then times the sine of the angle in between our momentum of each one of those little slices and our position vector, okay? So that's sine of theta i. Now again, because it's a circle, each one of these little points, these little slices, is moving in a circle. Now when you have uniform circular motion, your position vectors are going to be perpendicular to your momentum vectors because it's a radial vector and a tangential vector, and they're always got 90 degrees in between them. So that means that the sine of all my theta sub i's are 1. Okay? So if all of those go to 1, then I can write the magnitude of my angular momentum as the sum over all my little bits, r times mi times vi. Now, since all of my little points are located at the same distance from the rotation axis, then I can say that they're all the same, and they would all be equal to omega r. All of my little velocities would be equal to omega times r. Okay? So now I have, this r is constant, I can pull it out, and I have r times the sum over i, right, of all my little bits i, times the mass times my velocity v sub i, which is equal to omega r for all those points. Alright? So, omega is the same for all points, r is the same for all points, I can pull everything that's constant outside of my summation. So I have equal to omega r squared times the sum over all my mi. Now, the sum over all my little mass slices is just the total mass of my object, big M. So I can write that as omega m r squared. Now, if you notice, this is a hoop. The moment of inertia for a hoop is mr squared. So I can write that as my moment of inertia i times omega. Now we showed this for a specific shape, okay, for a hoop. But it's generally true, okay, this little proof is also generally true for whatever shape, okay? Although the summation might be more complex, might have a, a different shape, might have to take it to an integral for different shapes, it's pretty understandable for this little hoop, okay? But it's a general equation that's true. The angular momentum of a rigid object rotating about its center of mass is the moment of inertia of that object for that rotation axis times the angular speed. Now in vector form, you could write that as L is equal to I omega, where L and omega are the vectors. Okay, So what that's telling you is, we've already defined via our little curled fingers right hand rule, which way omega points, right? Okay. And that means that L is going to be parallel to omega for these situations. Using our new definition of L and our previous definition of our rotational kinetic energy, we can rewrite it in a different form. So if our rotational kinetic energy is equal to 1 half I omega squared, then we recognize that that could be rewritten as 1 half times I omega quantity squared over I. In other words, I've just multiplied the top and the bottom of that equation by i. Now, i omega is L, that's the magnitude of L, and so that means that I can write that as 1 half L squared over i. This is kind of similar for the um, uh, idea that k is equal to 1 half mv squared, which is our translational kinetic energy, can also be written as p squared over 2m. Now it's also true that an object can be moving relative to an external point and rotating about its own axis. So the Earth does this all the time, right? We're rotating about our own axis, but we're also moving in our orbit about the sun, all right? Another example is the wheel on a car, right? The wheel is rotating about its own axis and it's translating with respect to the road, right? Okay, so if you've got that kind of situation, then you can find the total angular momentum of that object, and it would be the sum of the angular momentum 
from the translation with respect to some external point, right? Um, for the Earth moving around the sun, it would be like treating the Earth as a point mass as it moves in its orbit about the sun, right? And then you could sum that up with the angular momentum of it rotating about its own axis. In other words, you know, we do that every day, right? Once a day, we rotate around on our own axis. Okay, so that would be expressed as the vector sum, L total, would be equal to the vector sum of L translational plus L rotational. So the translational meaning with respect to the external axis, treating that object as a point mass, okay? So I can prove that this is true to you mathematically, okay? I'm stealing a figure from your textbook, uh, Matter and Interactions. This is figure 1120 from the Matter and Interactions text. And what we're doing here is we're looking at a system. This simple little system could be actually made of a whole bunch of little point masses, but here they just pictured three, okay? So these three point masses are in a system together, and they're moving with respect to one another, with respect to their center of mass, but they're also moving in some kind of orbit or something with respect to this external point that's called A, okay? Now, you can uh, write the position vector for each one of those little masses as the sum of the position vectors from A to the center of mass of the system plus the vector from the center of mass of the system to each point mass. So I've expressed that here as Ri, which is the vector that points from the point A to the mass, right? Ri is equal to RCM plus RICM, okay? RCM points from A to the center of mass, and our ICM points from the center of mass to each one of the little point mass locations. And it's shown here nicely on this little figure. Okay? Now the total angular momentum of this system of point masses about A would be the sum over all the masses, I, right, of RI cross PI. All right? So each one of these things is moving with respect to A with some momentum P, PI. Okay? So the L total would just be the sum over all of them of Ri cross Pi. Now, subbing in for Ri, Ri is Ricm plus Rcm. So we can sub that into our summation and get L is equal to the sum over all I, Ricm plus Rcm, right, quantity, cross Pi. Okay, so I've moved that over onto this page here. And now, because cross products obeyed um, the distributive law, I can rewrite that expression in the following way. That would be the sum over all the point masses of RICM cross PI plus RCM cross PI, okay? That's obeying the distributive law. Okay, so this um, RCM cross PI, the sum over all of that, this RCM is a constant for all of these little masses. It just points from A to the center of mass, so that's the same for all. So I can move that outside of my summation. And then I have RCM cross the sum over all the masses of PI. And then, of course, I can leave the second sum term in that summation alone, plus the sum over I of RICM cross PI. Now, if I sum over all the momenta P sub I, then that's my total momentum of the system, or the momentum of the center of mass, however you want to look at it. So this RCM cross the sum over I of PI is actually RCM cross P total. And then, of course, we have on this second edition plus sum over I of RICM cross PI. So now let's identify each of these two terms. This first term is the translational angular momentum of the center of mass of this system, right? Moving with respect to that external coordinate. So that's L translational. And this second term here, that is the motion of each one of these little guys about the center of mass, okay? So that's L rotational. So L total is equal to L translational plus L rotational. Proved. Okay. Let me do an example problem um, from your Matter and Interactions text that uses these ideas. Here we have a barbell, and the barbell is made of two small balls, each with a mass of 0.4 kilograms at the end of a very low mass rod of length D is equal to 0.6 meters. It's mounted on the end of a low mass rigid rod of length B is equal to 0 0.9 meters. It's set in motion and it rotates clockwise with an angular speed of 15 radians per second about the center, okay? 
So that's the barbell center of mass rotating with an angular speed of 15 radians per second clockwise about location big B here. Now, in addition, the barbell rotates clockwise about its own center, about its center of mass, with an angular speed of 20 radians per second. So find the total angular momentum of the system. All right, now since they gave us the mass of the little balls, but they didn't give us the mass of the rods and they emphasized the fact that they're low mass, we get to ignore those with respect to the balls and just assume that we're looking at a bunch of point masses, I guess. Okay? So what we're going to do for this is we're going to break it into chunks. We're going to first find the angular momentum of the center of mass of the object, that L translational that I talked about a second ago. So to do that, we're going to model the system as a point mass, which means concentrating all of the mass at one point, right? So if we do that, then it would be a point mass with the equal to the total mass, which is 0.8 kilograms, and it would be located at the center of those rods, okay? And it's a clockwise rotation, and of course that means, by our little right-hand rule, that the angular momentum and the rotation axis, omega, would point into the screen. Now the moment of inertia for point masses is the sum over mi times ri squared, where mi is the mass of the point mass and ri is the distance from the rotation axis. In this case, we're just dealing with one little point mass if we're concentrating at the center of mass. So the mass is 0.8 kilograms, and then times the distance from the rotation axis squared, that would be uh, b, as it's identified in this problem, lowercase b, which is 0.9 meters. So it's 0.8 kilograms times 0.9 meters squared, and that gives us a moment of inertia for our little point mass model as 0.648 kilogram meters squared. Now L translational is the moment of inertia times the um, angular speed. So here that's ICM, which is the moment of inertia for the center of mass, times omega CM. So that's 0.648 kilograms meter squared times 15 radians per second, as it's identified in this problem. And that gives me 9.72 kilogram meter squared per second. Now the next part is to break this into the chunk and find the angular momentum of the masses rotating about their own center of mass. So for that, we're going to model the system as an extended body, which is two point masses of 0.4 kilograms each that are each 0.3 meters from the rotation axis. And that's because the total length of the bar is 0.6 meters, and each one of them um, is half that distance from the rotation axis. So it's a clockwise rotation again, so that means that the angular momentum points into the screen for clockwise rotation. And the moment of inertia for those point masses is the sum of MIRI squared, which is, um, there's two of them, so 2 times 0.4 times 0.3 meters squared. That gives us a moment of inertia of 0 0.072 kilogram meters squared. Now the rotational angular momentum would be that moment of inertia that we just found times the angular speed. So that's 0.072, sorry for that typo, 0.072 kilogram meters squared times 20 radians per second. And that gives a, a rotational angular momentum of 1.44 kilograms meters squared per second. Now, the total angular momentum would be the vector sum of these two things. They both point in the same direction, though. They both point into the screen. So that means that I can just add the magnitudes directly and say that the direction is into the screen. Okay? So L total is equal to L rotational plus L translational, which is 1.44 plus 9.72 kilograms meters squared per second. When I sum those two numbers, I get 11.16 kilograms meters squared per second. Okay? All right. Um, that's pretty much what I wanted to do in this lecture. I hope you understood it, and I'll see you in class.